Hello and welcome to my new Physics in Bevery series. This series I intend to cover different methods and forms of acquiring physics in Bevy, whether that's building it yourself, using external plugins, and finally when Bevy releases its in-engine system, how that works and how to use it. This series is going to start off by covering the Bevy Rapier crate, since I was requested to do so by one of my top tier patrons. I'd like to thank Manuel for sponsoring this episode. I'd also like to put a thanks out to the rest of my patrons. If you'd like to become a patron and support this channel, you can find a link to it in the description of this video. I'm planning for the series to be an in-depth look on how you can get physics in your Bevy application, starting with Bevy Rapier for the pre-stated reason. This episode will be giving an overview of what Bevy Rapier is, how it works, and why it's a good choice for a physics engine in the current state of Bevy. There will be supplementary videos coming out in the future that go more in depth on certain pieces of information. Some of these will be must watches, like how to actually include Bevy Rapier into your game, and others will be sort of supplementary reference material, such as all the components that Bevy Rapier supplies that you can include in your game. The components video will be a good substitute for my usual advice when it comes to physics, which is try and implement your own. Since when you try to implement something like a physics engine, you learn a lot of the types of things that you need to implement, such as dampening and restitution that you don't know to search for when you are starting out with a pre-built physics engine. The components video will cover all these sorts of components so you know at least what to Google to get the correct terms and come up with a use case and results. So what is Bevy Rapier? Well, Bevy Rapier is a plugin that allows you to interface your Bevy ECS world with a Rapier physics world. To cut down on memory and unnecessary compute, Bevy Rapier comes with two variants, Bevy Rapier 2D and Bevy Rapier 3D, that allow for simulating 2D and 3D physics world respectively. This is similar to Unity where the 2D and 3D simulations are separated and cannot interface with each other. But a key difference when it comes to Bevy Rapier is that it uses exactly the same interface for 2D and 3D and actually uses Rust's feature flags in order to enable and disable certain parameters when creating structs. This allows for the exact same named structs to represent both 2D and 3D. The major advantage of this is it reduces the learning curve required since users don't have to make sure that they're using something that works in 3D in the 3D physics world and the 2D variant in the 2D physics world. Since certain interfaces wouldn't work, since when you enable the 2D feature or the 3D feature, it simultaneously deactivates all the complementary components, which means that you don't have to worry about accidentally putting a 3D velocity onto a 2D object. This would cause for some things to become really confusing and pollute the namespace since you have to include 2D and 3D variants of everything in order to make the functionality work correctly if there's a difference between the 2D or 3D physics world. And if you want to keep the same naming space, you need to do things like ignore the Z value on a 2D linear velocity, which can result in users expecting the Z value to change something when it doesn't. In a 3D physics world, the linear velocity needs to be represented with a VEC3 since an object can move in all three axes. And the object's rotation also needs to be represented as a VEC3, since it is possible to spin around any of these specific axes along a given plane. Compare this with a 2D world, where you only need a VEC2 to represent the movement, since an object can only move in the X and Y axes. And this also reduces the number of rotations that an object can do, down to a single order of rotation, so it is represented with an F32, since it is not really logical to spin around anything but the Z axis anything else and you're actually representing a flat plane in a 3D world. Another advantage is that Bevy Rapier can use appropriate names for types, so beginners don't have to worry about appending 2D to all the 2D variants. But this also means that in situations where certain types of forces may have a different name in 2D representation than they do in 3D representation, Bevy Rapier can actually change the name of the struct without having to expect the user to know that restitution does something else in a 2D world. Instead, they can have a wholly unique struct that represents that information in two dimensions. However, there is one limitation that comes with this, and that is that you can't run a 2D and 3D world simultaneously, or at least not easily. Because both the 2D and 3D variants of the crate use exactly the same names, you can't import both of them universally. Otherwise, you'll have lots of name conflicts. I haven't tested this, but it should be possible to import both crates with different naming conventions in order to allow you to run two worlds simultaneously. But it is important to keep in mind that if you do import them simply in different files, that you need to make sure that you are attaching the 2D variant of velocity to a object in the 2D world and a 3D variant of velocity to an object in the 3D world, or Bevy Rapier will not detect the velocity and extract it into its physics world and therefore cannot correctly simulate the environment. 
though I wouldn't consider running two simultaneous physics worlds to be beginner level, so I'm going to ignore how to implement this for now. So how does Bevy Rapier allow you to interface with the Rapier world? Or furthermore, why isn't it just built into the Bevy world directly? Why do we need an entirely separate physics world? Well, this boils down to components, both for how it communicates and why the second ECS world is needed for performance reasons. I'll start with the communication layer, since for the scope of this video, this will be quite simple to explain. And then I'll move on to why exactly we split this off into its own physics world. So to set or read data to the physics world, you use components. When you attach the corresponding component to an entity, Bevy Rapier will extract the information out of the ECS world and place it into the physics world. And depending on the type of rigid body, we'll copy the data back from the physics world into the corresponding component in the ECS world. There are four types of rigid body flag that you can attach to your component. They are represented as an enum rigid body that can be attached and specify which type of rigid body it is. First is fixed, which is akin to read only. The components will be copied across into the physics world, but the physics world will not be able to interact or in interface with the components back. It'll obviously copy the data back across, but the object can't move in the physics world and therefore cannot manipulate the transform in the ECS world. The complete opposite is dynamic, which allows the physics world to completely control all components of the ECS world. This will read the data from the ECS world if it changes into the physics world. Then it'll do the physics calculation and write back the changes into the ECS world. This allows for things like the velocity to be controlled by gravity and also things like the transform to be moved by physics collision or velocity. There are also two in-between rigid bodies. These are the kinematic. One is position-based and the other is velocity-based and they are named accordingly. Like the fixed body, they are not affected by interactions inside the physics world, but the physics world is allowed to make changes and write them back to the ECS world. This means that collisions with a kinematic body will not interact and in interface with the velocity or anything else in the body, but the body will move according to its velocity. This is in a velocity-based kinematic body, obviously. In a position-based kinematic body, instead you move the body in your ECS world using whatever system, and Bevy Rapier will calculate what the velocity would have to be for the body to have moved like that, and then we'll use this for its physics calculations in the physics world. This means that things like kinematic bodies will just simply crush through the player if the player gets in the way, or continue through walls if they would collide with a wall, since they do not actually check to see if they are colliding with anything. And even if they were, the physics world has no bearing on their movement, outside of the control that you give it, such as allowing it to be controlled by the velocity. But this also means that things like gravity do not affect kinematic bodies either. Bevy Rapier works on a read-write if it can approach. This will make more sense when I cover the next section about why we need a separate physics world. But for now, look at it this way. Adding a component to an entity, Bevy Rapier will read that data into the physics world and then apply changes back. This means that if you just want to read data, you can simply attach the component and read it as well. If you want to write data, Bevy's change detection will be used in order to write the data to the physics world at the times when you have changed the data inside the component. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I will be doing a future video listing all the components that you can use to interface with the physics world. Though, if you can't wait for that video, there will be a list of them all in the description. But now leading on to why Bevy Rapier needs to use a separate physics world. The first and most obvious of these is because Bevy is fairly new and immature, which means that using the much more older and mature Rapier crate in order to achieve the physics world allows for a lot more feature complete functionality without needing to rewrite the entire crate from the beginning. There's another Bevy crate out there that allows for physics that runs entirely in the Bevy ECS world. The issue with this is it can no longer run in parallel since the physics world needs complete access to all mutable transform. But there is a deeper architectural reason to this. Unlike Bevy, where the logic is controlled primarily by the presence or absence of specific components, Rapier needs reasonable defaults for all the objects in the world. For example, it cannot calculate forces for an object that, without a mass, since force equals mass times acceleration. Bevy has the ability to query for objects that may or may not have specific components, but this is slow when compared to querying for components present only. Rapier, on the other hand, can use data structures and assumptions about objects like that they all will have a mass in order to make the code faster and more reliable than it might otherwise be if you were forced to conform with Bevy's ECS world. Bevy Rapier also provides four resources for communicating with the physics world. They are more about holding settings than they are about directly interfacing with the physics themselves. First is the simulation to render time. This indicates the difference between the physics world steps and the render world steps. 
This means that some things like the physics world can run at a faster speed than is rendered each frame. Or at least I think that's what it does. I haven't particularly looked into what it does if you change this configuration. There is also the Rapier Configuration resource. This allows you to set things that are universal for the physics engine, such as the gravity, whether it's running or not, and what time step is used. Next is the Rapier Context. This is the actual physics world itself and allows you to interface with the world in a more robust way, such as casting rays or shapes or getting collision information that is more detailed than is provided by other methods. And finally, there is the debug rendering context. This is the settings for the debug renderer that is enabled with the debug rendering feature. It allows you to toggle the rendering on and off, as well as what things get rendered, such as rays, collisions, AABB, bounding boxes, etc. The debug rendering is behind a feature since it can significantly slow down the time of execution on the code. I would also recommend to make sure that Bevy Rapier is compiled to Opt3 if you're going to use any of the debugging features, since this can rapidly slow the game down when it comes to rendering to the screen. If you've been watching my Making Minecraft in Bevy live streams, you would have seen this where my chunk generation code was running at something like one frame every four seconds when I had the render meshes turned on. But in compile time, I can have these on and still get 60 FPS. There is also events that Bevy Repeal will emit whenever a collision happens. These include a start and stop event that provides both the entity that is being collided with and the entity colliding. I don't know how it distinguishes which is which. And also a set of flags that can indicate slightly more information, such as if one of the colliders is a sensor, and if the reason that the collision stopped is because one of the colliders was deleted. Bevy Rapier may add more to these flags in the future, but currently those are the only two that are provided in the event that is emitted. If you need more information about a collision, such as collision force and stuff like that, you need to use the Bevy Rapier context in order to extract that information. I hope this video has given you a good starting point for understanding Bevy Rapier and helped you know what you need to start looking for in the future if you want to dive deeper into Bevy Rapier. Don't forget to subscribe to catch future videos in this series or check out my other videos. I highly recommend my Making a Platformer since in that I think it's episode two, I actually implement a physics engine by hand, and I highly recommend doing this so that you have an understanding of how physics engines actually work. Again, thanks to my patrons for their support. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description if you'd like to support this channel, and please do stay tuned for future videos.